Well, to discuss the study further, I'm joined by Human Sciences Research Council's Dr. Edmo Marinda and HIV clinician Dr. Cindy Fonsell. Thank you both for coming in this morning. Thank you. The, and I'll start with you, Dr. Marinda. Our rollout of antiretroviral treatment has been impressive for quite a while, but I imagine much more still needs to be done in terms of treatment in this country. Right. Uh, so, so if you look at the, the treatment program, it has actually doubled since 2012, the last time we did the, the last survey, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, the current tr treatment guidelines actually says every person who tests for HIV is eligible to go on treatment. And this is a fairly new guideline. It started in 2016. So in a sense, I mean, as much as we're sort of moving well, uh, the, there's still a gap in terms of covering, you know, uh, uh, putting people on treatment. It raises uh, the question, doesn't it, Dr. Finsale, about 60% of people are on antiretroviral treatment. Where is the other 40% and how do we reach them? Well, a lot of people still haven't tested for HIV. I think um, we are reach, reaching women. I always say this, that women interface with the health sector much more than men do. We need to find a way of getting more men to test for HIV. I think that that's what's missing. The majority that's missing is actually men. It brings us, Dr. Marinda, then to the issue of the accuracy of the numbers before us. 33,000 interviews, I believe, were conducted for this particular survey. So how accurate, then, are the stats that come out of it? Right. So, so th this is a national survey. Uh, we, we actually uh, sampled uh, a representative sample of the population mm -hmm. in order to provide reliable estimates for the various indicators that, that, that we measured. Um, in, in terms of, you know, sort of the spread, if you look at the, 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 the geography and the demography, it's supposed to cover all the nine provinces in all the you know, sort of selected, uh, 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 not districts, but the whole country. Mm -hmm. We did oversample certain districts, uh, but, but that, that was to provide more accurate estimates for specific markers in those districts. But it is a representative sample, um, and, and therefore, you know, there's no exact number. It's an estimate, uh, but they are accurate. I mean, they are fairly robust and accurate. Dr. Fincel, you interact with patients mm. quite regularly. You're in the hospitals. Do you find that the results of such a study are helpful at all for those of you who are dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with people who are testing for HIV and are then found to be positive, HIV positive in some instances? Well, for me, um, it, it does help. I think the age, the age group that I'm most concerned about is the, is the 15 to 24 year age group. I keep coming to that. I, I, you know, I speak about it a lot on social media, that what are we doing to reduce infections in that age group? And it, it has to go beyond just talking about the stats. We need to find out how are we communicating to that age group? Are we, are we communicating in a proper manner? Are we speaking about sex enough? What are we saying to those people to protect them from HIV infection? So it does help, but it's, it's important for us to go through those stats and see how we as clinicians can adjust what needs to be adjusted to bring infection rates down. And that's right. The study has again said that there's a concern about the number of HIV infections amongst mm. young women ages 15 to 24. And often when that comes up, when this particular conversation mm. is brought up, the language around the terms and what people think are the reasons for the infections are quite problematic. Well, look, intergenerational sex is something that is happening. We know about this. But my whole thing is, okay, so we know it's happening. What do we do to help, those, to help the women in that situation? And that's where things like pre-exposure prophylaxis come in. You know, why aren't we, why aren't we, why aren't we telling women about pre-exposure prophylaxis and then getting themselves to protect themselves from HIV infection? So there's a lot that still needs to be done. And a lot of it hinges around us speaking openly about sex and sexual health. There's also the issue of transactional sex, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because I remember when I first set foot on a university campus, mm -hmm. one of the buzz conversations at the time were issues of the students either having transactional sex with staff on the campus or other older people who prey actually on young women in particular. Mm -hmm. This has been something that's been around. It happened when I was at Varsity as well, and this was way back in 1996. Um, these things do happen, but again, what are we doing as clinicians to make sure that if you find yourself in such a situation, you're able to protect yourself, like from pregnancy, from STIs, and of course from HIV. Dr. Marinda, I want to come back to you here. So these young women, ages 15 to 24, in their particular interviews, what caught the human science, uh, what caught your organization's attention? Right. So this survey was more of a quantitative survey. Uh, so in terms of the questions that we asked, they were sort of limited. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, the conversation it has to go beyond the sort of biomedical issues. You know, 15 to 24 is a transi transitional period. Mm -hmm. People are maturing into adulthood. They're studying relationships. 
Um, and therefore, I mean, in a sense, I mean, we, we cannot, you know, sort of treat them the same way we treat, you know, older people. Mm. Uh, so the issues in terms of, you know, sexual activity, it's, 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 it's expected to happen at some point. Mm. The question is, I mean, is it happening in a safe uh, uh, way? Um, are they protecting themselves? What are the relationships between, the power relationship between themselves and the people that are, they're actually having sex with? Um, so those are very critical, you know, sort of uh, uh, issues. I mean, just to, 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 to add on that, um, the Department of Health have been trying to, to, to push, not to push, but to encourage sexual reproductive health in schools. Mm. And there's a lot of pushback from parents. Mm. You know, what are you teaching our kids? Are you introducing them to sex? Are you giving them condoms? But the reality is that, in fact, this is happening. And, and, and it's a reality that needs to be faced. Yeah, whether we like it or whether not. Whether we like it or yeah. not. And, and parents have to sort of uh, come on board. Mm. But I suppose that, again, comes back to the stigma around conversations about reproductive health, around sex, and of course what many still see as the boogeyman, the issues of HIV AIDS as a whole. Doc? Right, right. Um, I, I mean, it, 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 it comes back to the whole issue, the social cultural issues that we're talking about. You know, how easy is it to talk to your parent about how you feel, your sex, sex life, your relationships and everything else. Uh, and unless we, 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 we actually, uh, the parents come on board and do that, there's a lot of information out there. I mean, if you go 20 years back, there was no social media. It wasn't exactly. as, as prevalent as now. Yeah. So there's information that is there. The question, who's filtering that information and giving exactly. them the right, the factual issues to protect themselves? Uh, so the conversation has to happen with parents. Dr. Fonsell, social media has been around for quite a while now. Mm. So the government has known, and schools and everyone else, parents have also known that it is time to change the conversation, our messaging as well. Why is it then that all these years later we are still not getting it right? It's just, it's, it's, I think it's uncomfortable to discuss sex um, with, you know, with your parents. So we're going to be better parents because we know what to do. But I can't imagine having a conversation about sex with my father. And I think the same thing with you. We just need to come out of, you know, get our heads out of the sand and just do it. That's, that's really where we're at now. We know the stats. We know what's going on. We need to speak to our kids about sex. And we need to start now. I always say that the sooner you start, the better. And eight is a very good age to start speaking about sex. And also make sure that you use the correct terminology. You need to call the vagina the, the vagina, the vagina and the penis, the penis. You know, don't, don't speak around these terms and have nicknames for things like that. So if the kids hear the right stuff from you as a parent, then when they hear something else from their peers, they know what the right thing is. That's, that's why I speak to my kids about sex. They must know that this is the right thing from their mom. Everything else they hear will just be from their friends and they can always dismiss that information. Interesting that we keep coming back to the issue of language. And I'm wondering if in your survey, Dr. Marinda, that at all came up especially among the young people and indeed people who are now parents, as an area of concern in trying to manage and speak about HIV AIDS prevalence in our country. Right. So there is actually a communication module as part of the survey. Um, we, we haven't analyzed it and, and we haven't reported in, in extensively on it. But it is a critical point. How do you communicate you know, fairly taboo uh, uh, conversations mm. in a way that people understand? Um, how comfortable are our parents, as she rightfully said, you know, to be calling whatever needs to be called the correct name? Mm. Uh, so the communication issues, I mean, you know, um, um, and, and in terms of the, 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 the interventions, there are a lot of communication interventions that are actually going on. The yeah. question is, are they reaching the right people and are they actually being communicated appropriately yeah. to the right age groups? Dr. Marinda, Dr. Fonsell, so much more we could talk about. Thank you both for coming in today. That was uh, Dr. Marinda from the Human Sciences Research Council, Dr. Edmo Marinda, as well as HIV clinician Dr. Cindy Siwe Fonsell, speaking to us on ENCA today. Now, advocacy group Equal Education has lauded a court ruling in the Fix Our Schools case. The Bishaw High Court has ruled that.